Can you tell me what your priorities are for the work you do? Uh, first of all, to instill a high degree of trust, teamwork, and training to all of our military members, all of our DOD civilians, and the entire security enterprise that supports the region. Trust is very important uh, within our own military organizations, certainly with all of our partners and certainly with all of our allies. Teamwork is critical to, to make sure at the end of the day we're, we're taking advantage of, of what our diverse Air Force can bring to the fight and what our diverse Air Force can certainly bring to the region both here in Europe and in Africa. And on the training side of the house, it's, it's something that is, has been the backbone of our military success, certainly in the Air Force for the last 69 years, and what we suspect will be the backbone of success for, for the far, far future. And when you train hard, uh, you're confident in what you can do. You feel good about yourself because you can meet the requirements and the expectations of the combatant commander. And the other great benefit of being a highly trained force is it keeps folks that want to contest what you're doing a, a little bit farther at bay so that they're not as motivated to, to start conflict with an organization that's highly trained. Those, those are the three foundational efforts that, that are high priorities for me as I take over as the USAFIAF Africa commander. Well, there's, there's four major priorities here in USAFI and four major priorities that we have with AF Africa. And the, the first priority is to have a, a, a highly trained ready force. The, the second priority is to have ample access to forward bases so that we can be as flexible as possible. The, the third priority is to have an interoperable force, and the fourth priority here at USAFE is to make sure that we're doing all we can with our partners to be successful. So Jennifer, snapping back to that second priority, which has to do with access and basing, the, the key is as we gain more partners in the region, that we have the ability to take forces from all of the, all of the partner nations and all the allied nations and sprinkle them throughout the region and be in a position to where if I had to take a force that exists in Belgium, for example, a, a fighter attack aircraft, and snap it forward into the region, into the Baltics, uh, that I would have an installation, for example, a base that was adaptable and compatible to receive uh, that kind of resource. So access to basing is one issue, and also being interoperable is another, so that once we can get to that location, you can actually, as I like to say, get a lot of juice for the squeeze once we start to utilize those resources forward. And is there still a lot of work to be done in cultivating those? There is. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of work to be done in 2016, and I suspect whoever sits in my position five years from now would look in the eye and say, there's still a lot of work to be done. We're, we're never satisfied with how interoperable our bases are or how many that we possibly have. We've made some dramatic improvements over the course of the last 24 months and we're excited about the next three years for what we have in the can, so to speak, with respect to the advances that we'll make to future basing and getting access to those bases and ensuring that they are as interoperable as can be with the forces that we have in the region. there on a permanent basis to support joint training. Do you anticipate that model being duplicated anywhere else in the Eastern Europe? We do, and we hope so. So what you've seen, Jennifer, for the last 18 months in, in 15 and 16 has been a footprint of X, and what we anticipate is in 16, 17, and 18 that we'll be able to sustain that rate called X. And our hope is to have it increase over time. But for right now, with the funding that's in place and the commitments that we have on the books, we, we anticipate that those rotations to those installations that you've alluded to will continue in 16 and 17 and 18 and 19.
question to you is going uh, talking about Africa. Um, with Africa becoming more important to U.S. national security, how do you plan to improve partnerships with allies? We'll continue on the same pace that uh, we've we've currently embraced. Our dialogue back and forth with AFRICOM is robust. The the footprint of U.S. Air Force personnel and U.S. DOD personnel in Africa has been stable for for the last 12 months. So right right now we we have ample access to allow for appropriate intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance RPA assets to surveil the region. We want to make sure that each one of the assets that are involved in that ISR process, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, is in the right place at the right time so we can, we can maximize the return on investments. There are some of the resources that probably aren't in the appropriate spot based off the changing environment. And over the course of the next 12 months, in our consultations with AFRICOM, we'll ensure that all of the resources that we are responsible for in the air domain are positioned at the appropriate place based on AFRICOM's requirements to ensure that from an ISR standpoint primarily, uh, we've got the appropriate resource in the appropriate place at the appropriate time. And for right now, we're satisfied with what we have and we're making some small tweaks based off of the requests from the AFRICOM commander. So the ISR mission is very important to you. Very important. It's a very important mission for you, Safi, and a very important mission for AF Africa as we work with the AFRICOM commander on the continent of Africa as I wear my Afri Af Africa hat. Um, and then switching gears again, um, this past summer I had interviewed the outgoing 86th Airlifting Commander, General Tom, Brigadier General Thomas, and uh, he had told me that last spring um, here on Landstorm they practiced defending against the conventional air attack um, that the ISIS regime does with the, the system of aggregators. Um, is this a legitimate threat, Russia carrying in Well, Jennifer, what's, what's really legitimate are the, the requirements and requests of, of the UCOM commander. And General Scaparotti has been very clear in his messaging to me that we've transitioned from a phase of assurance to deterrence. And in order to better deter, you want to make sure that your forces, that, that you're in charge of, are as resilient and as strong as possible. So all of our forces here on the European continent and certainly those that are involved throughout the globe that we deploy from USAFE or we deploy from AF Africa are as resilient as they can possibly be. And part of that resiliency is the individual resiliency, your, your, your ability to, to endure and sustain and compete for long periods of time. And if you take that conversation all the way up to the installation level, we, we all want to ensure from a deterrent standpoint that our bases are as survivable and as hard as they can possibly be. And do you, are there any more exercises like that planned by your forces? There are. There are multiple exercises throughout all of our installations, certainly for calendar year 16 and more on the books through 17 and 18. Continual dialogue uh, with, with all of our alliances and all of our partners. So here in NATO, we, we have the luxury of an organization that's been netted and nested and committed to each other for decades and decades. And we have several partners who are highly motivated and excited to be part of that NATO alliance. Uh, we, we just held a what's called a North Atlantic Treaty Organization Air Chiefs Conference. So for four straight days, all 28 of the Air Chiefs and several partners were here with us at Ramstein. And we talked about all of the things that we can do from an interoperability standpoint to make sure that our forces nested appropriately with each other to where we could maximize each other's strengths uh, to, to have a stronger force end game. So those those conferences where you exchange tactics, techniques, and procedures on what your particular air forces are doing in their particular regions are highly important. And once you take a look at the involvement of all of those air forces in total, you're able to see where you can take pieces and parts and, and focus them towards a common goal to where you can maximize what those resources are doing and what their capabilities can bring to the fight and improve synergy overall to where you're 
total force capability is much, much higher. And that's what we did at the NATO Air Chiefs Conference. We, we had a conference a year ago that General Gorin's hosted. We'll have another conference in six months. And as a matter of fact, we'll have a conference tomorrow up in Udem, Germany, where I will get together with 14 of those Air Chief members, and we will talk about tactics, techniques, and procedures to improve the overall capability of our collective air forces. Well, uh, having the F-35 in USAFE is very important to me, and, and w we would love to get it here as fast as we possibly can. The, the, the timeline started two years ago. The, the preparation that has to occur at Lake and Heath, where it will first be bedded down here in the USAFE region, uh, we, we have uh, personnel in place, and, and we have uh, construction in progress in order to receive that aircraft. And as you well know, Jennifer, that, that will occur in the 18, 19, and 20 time frame. But for Todd Walters, as a USAFE commander, I can't get that F-35 uh, to our region fast enough. We're, we're very excited to have it. It uh, serves as a fantastic deterrence piece. Its capability is remarkable. It's survivable. It's adaptable. It is lethal. Uh, it force multiplies to a great extent what we can do with the rest of our forces. And we're all very, very excited to get that fifth generation asset on board here in USAFE. It, it does. It's, you, you can maximize the capability of that airframe to ensure that it fits appropriately with the rest of the environment. And part of the environment that will work with the F-35 is fourth generation uh, fighter attack aircraft. Uh, we, we have had several bilat engagements with other air forces to talk about fourth and fifth generation integration. That was a discussion topic at the NATO Air Chiefs Conference that I previously discussed with you. That will be a uh, topic of discussion in the conference that I will hold tomorrow up in UDEM, Germany. Uh, fourth and fifth generation integration improves the overall effectiveness of your force. It's something that's uh, been part of the training regime for the F-35 cadre starting two years ago to the present. And it's certainly something that we'll take advantage of over the course of the next several years to ensure that once that jet does get to the region, uh, we can maximize our juice for the squeeze by ensuring that the fourth generation assets that uh, are on the slate to participate from our NATO nations uh, are compatible and interoperable with the F-35 once it gets here. Number one, Turkey is a great ally. Uh, they're they're a, they're a NATO mainstay. They've they've been wonderful hosts uh, to our United States Air Force, and certainly at Instalik Air Air Base, we've 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 enjoyed the benefit of their hospitality. At this time, we're able to accomplish the mission uh, that we've had in the past with respect to the activities at at Instalik Air Base. The the airmen are motivated. Uh, they're they're ready, they're well taken care of. So right now the impact has been minimal. Uh, we're, we're comfortable that from a force protection standpoint, our U.S. airmen are well taken care of, particularly at Enserlik, and we have had uh, uh, no stoppage in our output with respect to mission capability out of Enserlik. Uh, we're, we're training hard. The, the, the smartest thing that we can do is to make sure that 100% of our folks are doing 100% of the work. And if every airman has a confident understanding of all the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are involved with their mission area, and they, they feel like they're operating in an environment that is training them to do what we expect them to do uh, for the mission, 
uh, we'll be in a position to where we can maximize our output based off the resources that we currently have. And, and my job as a commander is to take the wonderful resources that, that, that are currently underneath my command and, and work un, until the sun goes down uh, to make sure that all of our forces are trained as, as well as possible. And that's, that's currently the path that we're on, and right now we're having success with the relentless pursuit of training. We have. Uh, one of the initiatives of our Chief of Staff of the Air Force is to revitalize Squadron Command. And part of that uh, shift is to ensure that the structure of the squadron is optimized uh, to produce uh, the most juice for the squeeze, if you will. And what the Chief has us doing is, is taking a look at the construct of our squadrons to ensure that we have the right people at the right place at the right time. We may make some shifts with respect to the number of uniform military personnel and the number of civilians at each squadron. We're, we're still looking at that. And part of that examination is to take a look at the additional duties that all of those squadron mates have to ensure that what they are doing is applicable to the actual mission. And we feel in you safely that the alignment is, is pretty good. We're, we're still scrubbing it, uh, time will tell, but uh, I will hopefully in one year from now be able to look you in the eye, Jennifer, and tell you that we've got the construct just about right to make sure that we've optimized uh, who is in that squadron and what they're doing so that we can get the, the, the best possible output. That there's a lot. Uh, first of all, trust, teamwork, and training is very, very important. Uh, the, the, the second thing that I'd like to emphasize is, is an observation that I've had for the last 10 years of my service in the U.S. military. Our, our, our U.S. Air Force Enlisted Force is as capable as, one of I, as I've ever observed in my 34 years of service. As you probably know, Jennifer, 82% of our United States Air Force is enlisted. What, what excites me is when, when I have fought in the joint environment and in served as a staff officer on the joint environment is the, the number of non-airmen that walk up to me and brag and rant and rave about the capability, the, the tremendous capability of our enlisted force. I've had so many of U.S. Army colonels, U.S. Marine colonels, U.S. Navy captains walk up to me and comment on a U.S. Air Force tech sergeant, master sergeant, or chief and their comment to me is, your enlisted force is pure gold. Uh, that, that makes me very, very proud, but I'm also cognizant of the fact is that those wonderful airmen are, are a product of our environment that has been very, very focused on their training. An extremely capable force, one that uh, I'm very, very proud of, and one that I want to push very, very hard to continue to train so that we can, we can be as respected tomorrow as we are today. Jennifer, they're, 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 all, they're all favorites. Uh, for, for a person uh, of my age to be in a position to where I've been able to look back and say that I've had the opportunity to fly those aircraft, I can just look in the eye and say I, I love them all. Anything else you want to No, thank you very much. <laughs>